We're going to welcome Professor Jomo Kwame Sundaram from uh, Malaysia. Uh, professor Sundaram has both been a professor in Malaysia as well as a, a very high level uh, uh, UN uh, uh, official. And he is going to talk about COVID-19 and the future of sustainable development. Kerala is a very poor, prom, a very poor state, and uh, it's and it has relatively limited means. I think the Kerala experience is especially relevant and useful uh, to many African countries uh, where fiscal resources are very limited. So what we we find uh, in the Kerala experience are, are three uh, three elements. Uh, one the enforcement of uh, of the the enforcement of physical distancing. It didn't mean lockdowns, okay? I think it's very important to recognize that physical distancing does not require a lockdown. A lockdown is often a measure of last resort and a lockdown is often a very blunt instrument. And contrary to the image of a lockdown being a circuit breaker, we have to think about this epidemic as uh, comparable to what might be a viral network or uh, if you think about uh, multi-level marketing, or if you think of a root system in a tree where the roots grow as the tree grows and it spreads and, and, and more and more uh, minor uh, rootlets uh, sort of come from, from the main roots. This, so it, it's not as if you can just go to one particular point and cut off the circuit, the spread of the, of the virus. So the whole intention of a lockdown is to basically force people to avoid physical contact with one another, and therefore uh, the possibility of transmission of infection. And that is the intent of, of lockdowns. But lockdowns also have a tremendous effect, particularly on two sectors which are very important in developing countries. The first are the self-employed. So many people who are self-employed who uh, uh, the so-called informal sector, if you will, are often in a situation where they are very highly dependent on the daily turnover of, of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of businesses or whatever else they are running. And this becomes extremely important for their own survival, for their incomes and their survival. So when you do not have those types of ordinary transactions, it, it's very, very uh, um, it, is, it is, becomes very difficult for them. Um, and the other element, of course, are the daily rated workers, um, informal labor, if you will. So daily rated workers depend on, uh, on work each day. And if they do not have work uh, for, for, for a day, it, it's a loss of income. If you do not have, uh, in, um, if you do not have work for a week or two weeks, uh, it is a greater loss of income and can just imagine the catastrophic elements uh, you have in, in, for, if you do it uh, for longer periods. It's also important to recognize that it's often said that China has practiced lockdown. It is true, China did have a lockdown in Wuhan city and in the three provinces around Wuhan city. But in the rest of China, in the remaining 20 provinces, and we are talking about huge countries, larger than most countries in Africa. Uh, in, the, in, in the case of, of these provinces, the, in the other provinces, there was no lockdown. There were restrictions, physical restrictions, physical distancing was encouraged, but the, the restrictions were largely lifted after the end of the Lunar New Year holiday. So every year in China, uh, people tend, there, there are two periods of, of, of holidays. One is around the Lunar New Year and the other is around October. So dur during the time of the Lunar New Year, uh, many people go home to their, to, to their original villages and, and, and hometowns and so on and so forth. In the case of China, this was um, they, those who had gone home at the end of, of January were asked to stay home, home for an extra week. So instead of one week, the lock, the, they were asked to stay home for two weeks and they were compensated uh, through various means which the government decreed that the workers uh, who, who, who lost an income from one week were basically compensated 
And in the case of businesses who could not offer, afford to compensate, uh, the government also made uh, certain provisions uh, in the sense of uh, uh, providing wage supplements uh, to the businesses concerned. Now, this is a feature which has uh, happened uh, also in many other East Asian countries, in Korea, uh, in Taiwan, and so on. In, in, uh, South, in Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, most countries will probably not consider such op options except perhaps for the Republic of South Africa. And it's also important to remember that those are not the most vulnerable. The most vulnerable are the casual workers who are earning incomes on a daily basis. So coming back to, to, to Kerala, I think that the, the important lessons from Kerala is one, the emphasis on physical distancing without a lockdown. This is very important because what we have in the rest of India, and some of you may have seen video clips of what is happening in the rest of India, very brutal police treatment of, uh, worker, of people who have basically walked home from the cities they were in. Uh, from Delhi, from Mumbai, and so on and so forth. They have often had to walk hundreds of, of kilometers uh, to their home villages, their hometowns, because they knew they could not survive uh, in Delhi during this period. And there has been tremendous brutality by the police force, force against them. This is something you certainly want to avoid uh, because uh, lockdowns are very, very disruptive to social life. And when people know that the lockdown is going to last more than more than a day or two, um, they, are, they are going to resort to, to, to various measures uh, to try to, to uh, reduce the, the, the uh, improve their rates of survival uh, in such circumstances. Also, uh, uh, physical distancing is extremely difficult for poor people, especially in urban areas, because they live in very congested circumstances. And it is very difficult to have effective physical distancing uh, measures. In Kerala, there was also a big emphasis on, on sanitary measures, on getting on washing with soap. And the main reason for having soap is really the lather. It is the lather which goes, which basically um, the, the lather from, from, uh, from washing with soap, uh, it is the lather which basically penetrates the lipid layer around the protein, which is the virus. And when you, when you, when you uh, penetrate the lipid layer around, that, around the protein, you basically, uh, that, uh, the, 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 the protein uh, is more likely to be destroyed. So this is, the, this is why there is a lot of emphasis on, uh, on the washing of hands and so on and so forth. But it's important to remember that uh, many of the measures which are being proposed uh, particularly in the West, but also in, in East Asia, the richer countries of East Asia, are very difficult for poor people to practice. So we need to begin to think about what poor people are able to do in places like Kerala. So let me, let me come back to the other two things which the Kerala government uh, uh, has done. They have been very, very, uh, uh, they, have, they have done a lot to, to trace workers. Now, Workers in Kerala uh, work all over the, the world. The, Kerala has the highest state of literacy uh, in the whole of India. Uh, it has been, that has been the case since the middle of the 20th century. So you have a high level of literacy, but there are very few work opportunities in the state of Kerala itself. So many of them go abroad to work, and many of them have been working in the Middle East. But what has happened is that because of the war in Yemen and other factors in the Middle East, many of them have lost their jobs over the last couple of years, and some of the, and uh, and 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 some of them have and many of them have come back uh, to Kerala. So we find that when the lockdown took place at the federal level, at the central level in uh, Delhi, uh, a further load of migrant workers, people in uh, uh, Kerala people who had work, who were working outside of the state of Kerala also came back to Kerala during, for this period. So you have two sets of migrant workers, those who are working abroad, as well as those working uh, in the state of Kerala. And they came back, sorry, uh, in, this, in the country, in, the, in India, and they came back to Kerala. So you have well over 5% 
And it becomes extremely difficult, therefore, to identify people who are likely to, 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 be, uh, to be infected. And this is very challenging. It's extremely challenging because uh, what we now think we know is that you can be infected without any symptoms uh, uh, for about five to seven days. And even after that period, there's a period when you are infected and you have what are called pathogens. Um, you, it is very expensive to test at that early stage of uh, pathogens where, you, where, where antigens uh, have, have, the body uh, develops antigens to deal with the pathogens. So usually the cheaper uh, testing methods are only become uh, significant between about 10 to 14 days. And those, and those is when, that is when antibodies uh, develop. And the test for antibodies is much, much more significant. So you can, so the part of the problem why it is so difficult to deal with this invisible enemy is the, pro, is the fact that, you, you are, that it's almost asymptomatic, at least for a certain period. Uh, and, uh, and even for, you can be infected without actually uh, showing uh, many symptoms. So over half the people who are infected actually don't even have symptoms, uh, even when uh, after, after the 10 day period. So this is why uh, testing becomes extremely important, but the tests are very, very expensive. And so what we have seen in the case of Vietnam, in the case of Bangladesh recently, is the development of cheaper testing methods. Uh, cheaper testing methods, uh, probably not uh, approved by any international uh, authority, uh, but generally recognized as quite effective. And so you find that a leader of the opposition in uh, Bangladesh, uh, Zafrullah Chaudhry, has developed this, and the government of Bangladesh has basically put aside its political differences with Chaudhry, who was leading the opposition uh, before the election last year, has put aside their differences and basically embraced Chaudhry to, to prepare these testing kits. So we can see a great deal of innovation on the part of developing, of, of developing countries in terms of trying to cope uh, with, with, uh, with, this, with this problem. Now, the third element which I want to emphasize uh, in the case of Kerala is the fact that Kerala basically recognized, and it's probably the only government in the world, which has recognized that the people who are going to be the most affected are the, uh, are the uh, daily rated workers and the self-employed. And, and, and this is very unusual because in most other countries, including my own country, Malaysia, we see that many of the measures ignore these two very vulnerable groups because in a sense, they are very difficult to track down. They're very difficult to track down, they're, they're not well organized, they're not well documented, we don't know how to reach them, and so on and so forth. So uh, this, I think, is, is, is important. Now, the other, emphasis, the other points to emphasize, both from the Kerala experience, as well as the East Asian experience, including Vietnam, is early action. So what was really sad and lacking in the West is that although information became available at the end of last year, and China even uh, basically uh, did work to, 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 to trace the genome of the, of the virus uh, by early this year and shared that information by the second week of January. And there have been a lot of researchers all over the world working on, on various aspects of the problem. We find that, uh, the, that, uh, that many countries outside of East Asia and Kerala uh, did very little to prepare themselves for the crisis. And the most outstanding examples, of course, are the UK and the US. I'm going to spend a minute talking about the UK and the US uh, before I move on to the next part of what I'm going to say. And that is, in the case of the UK, they, for some reason, uh, Mr. Johnson and his uh, government decided on developing what is called herd immunity. In other words, let the, let the uh, infection spread throughout the population, a certain share of the population uh, and that, that true exposure to the, to the virus, uh, they would develop uh, immunity over time. 
uh, it was only around uh, in mid middle of, of March when Imperial College of London came out with its first of its two studies that they, they, they noted that over 1% of the UK population would die in the process. And when that happened, uh, Johnson was, was, uh, was uh, government change tech. And so they have, because they acted late and they in a sense did nothing to stop the infections from spreading, they, they, they have had to resort to, to, to lockdowns. In the case of the US, it's a very well-known story and, and uh, the, uh, probably the most well-known African today, Mr. Trevor Noah, uh, who I'm sure has, has kept many of us entertained by reporting on what is happening uh, there. But, but I think what, what, is, what is important to, to recognize is the importance of early action. Now, the fact that we, it's still not clear why the infection rates seem to be low in Africa. It could be due to three, at least three possible factors. One, um, it has not really spread uh, uh, to Africa as much as to other parts of the world. The second possibility is that we just, uh, that there, there are certain uh, elements in Africa which contribute to, to certain uh, uh, immunity, uh, if you will. And a third possible is that there is just not enough testing. So the fact that you have a low level of reported infections is no cause for comfort, especially if you have not done very much testing. And this is, I think, very, very important. Unfortunately, the cost of the testing is very high. And this is part of the reason why it becomes a huge dilemma. And so I think I just want to, to end this part uh, here. Now, what does this, all this mean for us? Um, I think from, for those of you who are uh, more economically inclined, uh, in the past, when we have had financial crisis and we have had financial crisis, uh, what we have done, generally speaking, has been to uh, resort to Keynesian type uh, policies uh, to try to increase aggregate demand by increasing government spending. That has been the general mode. Many, many of us have tried to uh, tweak it to make sure that the government spending uh, benefits the people to try to make sure that the government spending develops, uh, promotes uh, sustainable development. Uh, for example, uh, when I was working at the UN about a decade ago, uh, when the great uh, so-called uh, uh, the, the, the global financial crisis started, uh, was followed by the so-called Great Recession, uh, we recommended and called for a global Green New Deal, a new deal of the, of, uh, comparable to what Roosevelt did, uh, but also emphasizing that it must have international solidarity and that it was in the best interest of developed countries to spend, and we suggested one trillion uh, for developing countries. And the, the, the green element we, which we are proposing was a big push towards renewable energy. So we pointed out that well over a billion people in the world today do not have access to modern electricity. Uh, and we were uh, to, to electricity, and we were recommending that that uh, that there was the possibility of providing electricity for all, uh, 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 particularly in the poorer countries of the world, uh, by by um, by uh, uh, using renewables. In in other words, bypassing the stage of uh, uh, of uh, fossil fuel energy. And this was our, our proposal. At that time, uh, um, the, the fossil fuel prices were still reasonably high. Now they have come down uh, much more. And so it appears uh, uh, to be uh, less attractive uh, compared to fossil fuel. But in, that, in those days, it was still relatively high. And we, had, we showed that the price of, uh, uh, of, for example, photovoltaic solar panels uh, had come down very considerably since the mid 1990s, and it was very feasible uh, for for developing countries, particularly in the tropical zone, uh, to 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 have to turn to renewables at, at a relatively low cost. So that was the basic uh, elements of the global green new deal. But this time it's different. 
Why is it different? Because the problem is not on the demand side alone. It's also on the supply side. Workers who want to work cannot work. Farmers who want to farm often are frustrated from farming because even if they produce whatever they are producing, there are no transport systems which are able to collect their produce and take the, take the produce uh, to the urban areas, to, to markets and so on and so forth. So this is the challenge. So you have not only a demand side problem, which is a, the typical Keynesian, uh, which, which leads to the typical Keynesian solution, you also have a supply side problem. Not of the supply side problems, which, which the Americans were very concerned with in the 1980s, but a very different supply side problem of workers and others people wanting to work and not able to work. Not able to work because of the lockdown or not able to work in the normal, the normal type of work because of physical distancing. Now, because we are very far from a, from, from a vaccine, we are, going, we are going to have to live with, uh, with this problem for some time to come. In other words, we are going to physical distancing has to become a normal part of much of social life. And this is a very, very huge challenge. And this forces us to, to think about how production processes and other economic activities can be reorganized to try to, minim to, 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 to have a certain degree of safety. Physical distancing, of course, is not the only means if you have enough protective equipment, uh, um, uh, and so on and so forth, you can, you can actually, and other types of precautionary measures, we can reduce the vulnerability uh, and the likelihood of infection. But this, of course, is the major challenge which we have uh, 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 today. So how, how, what, what will this mean? What, what does it mean to have precautionary measures as a normal part of our life? And since we will probably be producing much, much less as a result, it also allows us an opportunity to rethink our priorities. What are we going to try to produce in future? Okay, if you leave it in simply to investors to decide, the investors are going to probably going to invest in greater automation to reduce the require, labor requirements. Because with greater automation, you can have a lot of economic transactions and bypass labor. In other words, working people all over the world will become increasingly irrelevant to the capitalist system. This is one realistic possibility if you think about some of the, some of the possible responses uh, to, uh, to the COVID crisis. So the other possibility is to pay far, far more attention to um, uh, uh, alternative types of, of, of activities, including uh, care work. And I, I want to emphasize care work. Of course, a lot of this right now will be health related, but it's also important to begin to recognize that in many of our societies, life expectancy has increased and there needs to be far more attention given to, 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 the, to the entire life cycle and to think about uh, improving the quality of life for our older people who have often worked very hard uh, and, and, and deserve to live a life of dignity uh, in their old age, as well as to pay far more attention to younger people and to begin to think much more of, about questions such as food safety and so on and so forth. So many of these issues are addressed uh, by the uh, Sustainable Development mm -hmm. Agenda, or what mm -hmm. is often called Agenda 2030. And it is, a, it is a real possibility to begin to advance that agenda. And that's why I think we need to begin to think creatively about the, 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 uh, the, uh, this crisis and the, the, the possibility it all opens to us to begin to rethink social life. Now, much of the rethinking of social life will involve uh, redu changing the, the ways in which we interact with each other. You know, uh, it is, it is uh, often uh, we, we, we in the South uh, think of uh, our relations with our families and with our friends in terms of very physical types of relations. And we will need to begin to rethink that. What are the possibilities thereof? Uh, what are the possibilities of how do we change, for example, teaching? 
uh, for many people, especially in the South, um, you know, distance education is not a realistic possibility if we don't have, uh, if we don't have uh, 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 the facilities for all people, if you don't have electricity, if you don't have uh, 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 computers and, 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 and so on and so forth, affordable computers. So we have to begin to rethink how social life is organized. And this is a huge challenge. So I think we really need to begin to think about why, what life is going to be like, like uh, not only uh, to, to try to avoid the lockdowns in the first place, but even when lockdowns are unavoidable, to begin to think about life beyond the lockdowns, because we are not talking about a vaccine which is going to emerge uh, very promptly. Now, in 1996, uh, the newly elected president of South Africa, Nelson Mandela, insisted on the public health exception to the, uh, the, the, the new legislation uh, strengthening intellectual property rights. Uh, unfortunately, most developing countries have not availed of them, themselves of it. And from, the, from about 15 years, uh, countries which are producing generics and exporting them to Africa, India, and, and so on, were not allowed mm -hmm. to do so through the tighter enforcement of intellectual property rights. So now we have a situation where African uh, countries are often deprived of uh, the use of generics, uh, and they are relatively, uh, um, you know, they, and they are and there are economies of scale in producing medicines. So we need to begin to think about, about whether this is the time to once again challenge uh, the, 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 the intellectual property rights, which have been so much a feature of life over the last three decades or so. This will, 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 will significantly transform life, but we have to recognize there are very, very powerful interests who are going to work against it. Uh, we, we have, what is at stake, for example, right now is who is going to control the cure? Who is going to control the vaccine? Uh, if, if it is going to be, if the, the Cubans and the Chinese uh, have been working together on one particular vaccine, and if their, uh, if their vaccine proves to be the, the, uh, the solution, it is now at the testing stage, uh, uh, hopefully, uh, they will not take advantage of it to try to, to make the most of themselves, for themselves. But you can imagine what was likely to happen if an American company, for example, uh, has uh, 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 secures the, the patent uh, to the vaccine um, or uh, secures a patent to a cure. Um, this are all very, so in a way, uh, this whole crisis has forced us to think about very fundamental aspects of social life, of economic relations, about the law, and, uh, and so on. And, and this is pre pre particularly why uh, I, I think it is for us uh, to, 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 to use this opportunity to reflect uh, not only on the urgent, on, but what needs to be done now early action in particular, and the varieties of early action uh, which, are ne which are necessary, but also begin to think very uh, seriously about how social life uh, will need to be reorganized, how economic life will need to be reorganized uh, in the time to come, and how we can begin to think about changing the rules of the game, not only uh, at the international level, but also in our own societies. So I've taken up 40 minutes. Uh, Mahmoud, thank you very much for this opportunity. Let me stop here so that your discussants have a chance to respond to some of the issues raised. Thank you. Thank you, Jomo. I should have added in introducing uh, Jomo that, uh, and some of you may have wondered uh, how a person in Malaysia gets a name like Jomo Kwame Sundaram. Now, Jomo, the first name comes from Jomo Kenyatta. Kwame, the second name, comes from Kwame Nkrumah. And I assume this was not Jomo's own doing, but his family's doing. His, his parents, uh, who, who were uh, internationalists, 
or anti-imperialists uh, at that point decided to name uh, 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 named the sun after two African anti-imperialists. And Jomo grew up to, to do honor and justice to that name. Thank you very much, Jomo. Um, I noticed uh, three things uh, before I introduced the discussants uh, uh, in this presentation. Uh, one is a very important debate you, you have uh, introduced, uh, physical distancing versus lockdown, um, the two are not the same, uh, and the pros and cons of physical distancing versus lockdown. Secondly, how this, the economic crisis is probably going to outlast the public health crisis. Uh, and the economic crisis, how it is different this time uh, from the last one the world went through, uh, in that this time it's not only on the demand side, it's also on the supply side. And thirdly, the question of intellectual property rights, um, Nelson Mandela's uh, health exception. And I would just like us to think about the AIDS uh, debate and controversy in South Africa. Uh, if you remember at the time of Thabo Mbeki, there were two debates going on. One was Thabo Mbeki's calling of a conference uh, of dissident uh, medical scientists who insisted that the, the, the key issue in HIV AIDS was the underlying condition, uh, not just the infection. And that the people who die are the people with an underlying condition, therefore pointing, indicating, pointing their finger to poverty and, and, and the poor. And the second big issue was generics versus pharmaceuticals. Uh, pharmaceuticals financed a major campaign. And, and the unfortunate thing was, was that part of this campaign uh, was, was joined by uh, some, some of the most vulnerable groups uh, in the AIDS infection. And, and the campaign basically demanded that South African budget, as much of it as possible, the health budget, be spent on the purchase of antiretrovirals. And Becky pointed out that 90 or 100 percent of the budget would have to be spent. And over two or three years, I think, the South African government negotiated with Indian pharmaceuticals to supply generics in the teeth of the opposition. My understanding is that this was one of the reasons Becky lost. Uh, his pres presidency. Um, but this, this debate is coming back now. Uh, and I think we should be, we should be conscious of it. Uh, I did not know that the Cubans and the Chinese were, were collaborating in, uh, in creating a vaccine. Uh, but I assume that's good news. Thank you very much. Now we go to our discussants. Uh, the first discussant, uh, David uh, Muinga. David, you will have 10 to 12 minutes. Um, I'm going to be uh, a disciplinarian. At the end of 12 minutes, I will say that it's 12 minutes. Thank you. David. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Go ahead. OK. Yes. Uh, to, to begin with, I would like to thank uh, Maisa for the opportunity to engage in this debate on the COVID-19 pandemic, which continues to ravage communities across the globe in uh, ways never thought possible. But also I'd like to thank uh, Professor Sanderman for such an insightful discussion and engagement with and on this novel and critical issue in global economy today, uh, which will most definitely require collective effort across the board in uh, posing sustainable solutions uh, towards alleviating the impact of, of the pandemic. So um, in this paper, uh, the paper that was provided uh, for the seminar, uh, Professor Sanderman addresses a number of key issues. Uh, he critiques the significance of uh, lockdowns as, uh, as a means of addressing and curtailing the spread of COVID-19, not only in, uh, in its uh, current usage, but also its implications for future economic stability. Uh, he further makes a call to draw lessons from uh, 
the East Asian experience and their response towards the pandemic through uh, partly through a trifaceted series of what he terms a trace, taste and treat, uh, which he considers uh, an alternative to the draconian lockdowns, uh, popularly employed as a response to the pandemic. So this proposal draws from the unique elements uh, of response, particularly uh, in East Asia, which employed physical distancing as opposed to social distancing, uh, lessing into consideration the social cultural dynamics of particular regions uh, like Kerala in India, which he discussed about the caste system. So more so the paper analyzes how the COVID-19 pandemic is not only transforming society, but further seeks to restructure it into what uh, Professor Sanderman refers to as the new normal, a form in which uh, the implications uh, will create a novel and a novel social and economic uh, order. So uh, in reading the paper, it's, it's quite clear that for Professor Sanderman, lockdowns are not really the appropriate form of response towards the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, their impact on economy particularly is detrimental to the sustainability of development and they have adverse permanent effects by disrupting supply chains, not only nationally, but internationally as well. So as such, the lessons he draws from East Asian countries like the trace, test and treat, as well as physical distancing are not only less costly, but also curtail the disruption of economy. However, while Professor Sanderman hails the exclusivity of the East Asian uh, response, as well as that of Kerala in India, he does not consider that such solutions are at most times exclusive themselves. They do not consider the political, economic, and spatial differences of other, society, other societies. So while mass testing may be possible uh, in some economies, uh, how should it function in you know, largely informal and developing economies? So it appears not to consider class as well as social differences. Mostly when he mentions that uh, a test in, in, in South Korea costs about 130 US dollars. Uh, even, even when uh, one who is found uh, with, with COVID-19 uh, is, 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 is refunded that money, how many low class individuals are able to afford, afford that? Mostly it doesn't uh, put into consideration opposition to uh, these, these three T's as well. For example, here in Uganda, cultural leaders uh, came up to oppose uh, this, this, this uh, COVID-19 entirely as not an, uh, uh, an African uh, disease. So how do these dynamics then play out in, 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 in his argument? Uh, but also more so it would seem that, prof that for Professor Sanderman, the lessons he draws are in so much as they sustain the operationality of economy and not exactly that of the human cost. So it, it, it explains why he argues that while public and, and, and social and other social, including religious gathering and sports events have been strictly prohibited, many essential economic activities may well continue subject to the imposition of physical distancing and precautionary measures to minimize the risk of transmission. So thus, it's not so much the effect of a lockdown the, that the lockdown will have on human life, but rather that which it will have on the economy. So while both the human and economic spheres are critical, for Professor Sanderman, the social relations or the human dynamic is embedded, uh, as, as Polanyi would note, embedded in the market and not the other way around. And so it's the sustenance uh, of the market that the human cost in the long run uh, can be cut, curtailed. So more so the new normal that Professor Sanderman posits is not in fact instigated by the social fabric, but it's rather driven by the imperatives to transform and digitize the economy to allow the functioning of economy even uh, within uh, the household. So I'll, I'll get to that shortly as well. But then again, it's quite clear that uh, Professor Sanderman's methodology employs uh, what I would term a, a, a partly a post-mortem approach because it begins from the conception of existing infection before it, the three T's of trace, test and treat or the physical distancing without lockdown is employed. So in this case, countries like Uganda, which employed a lockdown prior to confirmation of a COVID-19 case, do not fit uh, Sanderman's uh, criteria until a case is reported. 
So as such, the impact of a lockdown in Uganda, which so far seems to be yielding decent outcomes, is not considered a lesson to learn from Uganda unless it contributes to sustainability of development. And so my other, the other critique that I, that I, that I have is, is in regards to the idea of the new normal that Professor Sanderman discusses. So for, for Professor Sanderman, structure seems not to be really historical, but it's rather created by the events present at a given point in time in society. So in, in this case, COVID-19 pandemic is not only a critical occurrence in modern day economy, but it's rather a process through which society uh, in this case, global society is not just altered, but will be restructured to a supposedly homogeneous new normal. One in which uh, socio-economic dynamics of society will be restructured to discount, at least in the foreseeable future, special forms of global linkage. For example, on, in, in the paper on page six, some of these were travel and tourism. And in, in other words, it will emphasize the time compression of national and global activities of which he mentions one as distance learning. So this, this is actually affirmed uh, when he discusses that public investment in digital technology needs to be accelerated to ensure that the weak, the poor, the vulnerable and marginalized are not left behind. So he continues to say that the digitization and digital transformations of certain industries and services may well accelerate investments to enable employees to work remotely. So in, in this I question, is Professor uh, Sanderman acting as an advocate of the globalization agenda? You know, does COVID-19 then provide an avenue through which globalization can be further entrenched into global economy? So it would seem that uh, Professor Sanderman's conception of a restructuring to a new normal is not new per se, but rather a tool through which globalization can be further accentuated into the echelons of uh, developing societies. So because I wouldn't want to claim to sum up my debates as Professor Sanderman's argument, it is pertinent that I raise uh, some questions. So particularly regarding the notion of the new normal. So what exactly is the new normal that you discuss? When, when do we see this new normal emerging? How is it structured? You know, is it dynamic? Or is it, is it similar in occurrence across the board, irrespective of political and power dynamics? Or does it play out differently in different societies? In other words, is it globally homogeneous? Uh, also, what happens to the old? Uh, is it done away entirely in exchange for this new normal? Um, how does this uh, new normal affect the structures of imperialism and colonialism in, in, in uh, developing uh, ex-colonized countries. I also think that uh, Professor Sanderman also speaks of this new normal as an inevitable event or process. So is it actually inevitable or do different economies respond uh, differently to it? So lastly, uh, Professor Sanderman does, does sort of seems not to consider the significance of the informal sector uh, other than its need to be transformed into the enclosures of a digital society. So in so doing, he does not account for the significance of the informal sector that the informal sector is playing during the pandemic. For instance, uh, while food is scarce, subsistence production is, 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 is helping to sustain rural as well as urban communities in Uganda. Uh, so for Professor Sanderman, sustainable development is the best thing uh, since sliced bread whatever avenues a country may take in response, as long as these avenues are not in line with sustainable development, they are not conducive, even in as much as they protect uh, human sustenance. So this ideological- Half minute, half minute, half minute to wind up. Okay, so this ideolo ideological position makes uh, Professor, Sanderman's, Professor Sanderman blind to some of the underlying politics and social dynamics of countries beyond their economic relevance. So uh, since this is a novel issue in itself, I hail uh, Professor Sanderman for taking initiative to think through uh, means of a workable solution. But then again, I, uh, we, we can't convincingly discuss COVID-19 uh, unless it's, it's done. But uh, thank you for the opportunity. Yes. Thank you, David.
Uh, we now move to our second uh, discussant, also called, uh, also with the first name of David, David uh, Gendo Chimba. David, uh, we'll come back to you. I suggest you relocate yourself, uh, and 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 we'll go on to uh, Professor uh, Garabuzi. Uh, well, I uh, I also want to thank uh, Professor Senderam for a very thoughtful uh, presentation. Uh, on an issue that is uh, uh, fairly current and uh, over which there hasn't been much time to think through some of the uh, broader implications. And I think he has raised a number of important considerations. Uh, I will not go over them. Some of them have been uh, articulated by uh, uh, Professor Mamdani uh, and others by a good summation by, uh, uh, by David. Uh, what, what I I want to do is to perhaps uh, provide a little bit of more context and add to some of those considerations uh, in regard to some of the key debates that have arisen that I think are critical to both understanding the moment and also uh, the action that we need to take uh, going forward, depending on where, uh, uh, what responsibilities uh, we have. Um, so I want to start by saying that most of what we have been preoccupied with is the sort of the immediate term and the immediate considerations uh, to which uh, Professor Sandler spoke very uh, eloquently. Uh, and a number of the actions uh, taken by uh, governments and communities uh, have been advocated and undertaken with, m with minimal consultation and debate. Uh, in some cases, also minimal scientific evidence. So it is hard to think of this as, a, at least on the outset, as a democratic moment. The question, of course, arises, are these the right actions? And I think in some respects, uh, I identify with that uh, sentiment in uh, Professor Sandran's uh, contribution. There will likely be a debate at some point between the actions taken, for instance, by the Ugandan government versus the, the known actions taken by the Tanzanian government on the question of uh, lockdown and uh, the uh, broader question of uh, physical and social distancing. Uh, there may be empirical evidence uh, for helping us decide this question, but really the value of uh, that consideration would be for future pandemics. Or, uh, uh, but there are other implications of both those actions as well as actions that will be taken in the intermediate and long term that are important to uh, development in Africa and other global South countries, both at the macro and micro level. And it's a question as to whether they pretend <coughs> there are important changes and corrections in the way that the political economy is ordered, both nationally and globally. And what are the implications for uh, human security and national security regimes? Has the COVID-19 moment raised questions about the reliability and security implications of global supply chains and posed a national question in terms of the national production of essential goods and services. What about the global vertical integrated processes of production and the just-in-time uh, production processes? We will see more or less concentration in terms of uh, transnational production or the possible inter intensification of uh, monopoly capital as states and uh, banks prop up large producers at the expense of small and medium-sized producers. When market displacement happens, what will, mean, uh, what will it mean for the informal sector producers and service providers? Perhaps will there be greater competition and more precarity in that sector than has been the case. And there's a broader question to be asked as to whether uh, the COVID-19 moment has rendered the neoliberal project, uh, has rendered the neoliberal project into which many African countries were conscripted, forcibly or otherwise, intellectually bankrupt. Has it opened the door to revive, to a revival of collective economics and national planning, for instance? Uh, what about the contested role of the state and state power and the national question, or even the question of sovereignty? Uh, uh, Professor Senator raised the question of uh, intellectual property, for instance, every property, for instance. We face a new world uh, order where a global travel and borders are tightened for the foreseeable future. And what does that mean for migrant labor, international employment uh, schemes, and remittances to African countries. Uh, 
that, uh, because this is a phenomenon that uh, essentially has increasingly become part of uh, a development strategy for many Af some African countries. What does it mean uh, for those countries and what does it mean for the countries that the receiving countries in that context? Uh, we talked, uh, some of them talked about the Middle East, for instance, but also uh, um, uh, Europe and, uh, uh, and uh, North America. Uh, and by the way, with examples of cleaner air and cleaner water in some of the countries in the global north and global south, uh, in the few weeks that we've had uh, uh, the lockdowns uh, or the shutdowns of the economies, is there a sharper question regarding the ecological implications of shutting down economies for a moment? Is this a moment uh, for degrowth to be considered a uh, uh, significant and relevant development strategy, or at least the scaling back of productivism? Uh, as an important consideration. And what are the implications in regard to uh, climate justice? I think Professor Sanderon spoke to this question of uh, uh, the possibility of a uh, uh, framework for climate justice that would, uh, uh, that would transfer uh, over a trillion dollars to uh, countries in the global south, right? So an article by uh, Ishan Tharu in the Washington Post today identified what he argued it was an irony in the thinking of the COVID-19 crisis when it comes to Africa and other countries in the global south. While the focus has been on the potential horrors of the high rates of infection and potential loss of life due to the challenge uh, of poor healthcare systems and, in, and inevitable uh, inability to ensure social and physical distancing because of proximity, the proximity in which many people live in uh, uh, poor living conditions. Uh, he quite raised a question very similar to the one that Professor Sanderson has raised about this notion of adhering to lockdown measures and the extent to which that notion uh, is a received notion from the global north as opposed to something that has emerged out of uh, the experience of the global south. In spite of the fact that the global south has had experiences with uh, both pandemics and uh, epidemics uh, 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 similar to this, uh, I can think of uh, Ebola, uh, Zika, uh, those kinds of uh, experiences. And he also raised the question of what limited uh, travel and uh, integration into the global uh, economy might mean if that is uh, an outcome for uh, African countries and African peoples, broadly speaking. He says, though, that there's a thinking that has been led largely by a focus on the health dimension of the crisis without a, uh, an appropriate counter consideration with regard to the economic dimension uh, of, of, of the crisis. And yet uh, there is uh, uh, appropriate uh, consideration that need not be uh, given to both dimensions of, of, of the crisis. The shutdown in uh, uh, the uh, economies like Uganda's economy is going to have a disproportionate impact on the Ugandan economy and on particular segments of the population in Uganda. And just yesterday, the Ugandan president extended that shutdown. He put the economy on ice for another three weeks, the impact of which is absolutely uh, unclear. And there's a, a broad question as to what the basis in terms of uh, evidence is uh, for, for that decision. But to be fair, this has been a common response in most of Africa, uh, regardless of the numbers of infections or mortality, except of course for Tanzania, which has taken a skeptical uh, approach. And uh, again, the Tanzanian president uh, this week asked the Wanainchi to go out and work to keep the economy growing. And I think in some ways that represents an important debate we have not had and we probably needed to have, and maybe we don't have the capacity to have because of the nature of the uh, uh, state power. So Thara says, yeah, even if the virus doesn't spread impact uh, cities and towns where effective social distancing is impossible in parts of Africa, the pandemic will already have had a bitter price. For hundreds of millions of people suddenly stripped of their livelihoods, daily wages and the means of their family survival, poverty may, may kill sooner than the virus. The pandemic is already confronting some of the world's poorest nations 
with, their great, with the greatest economic challenges they have had in decades. Income losses in developing con uh, countries expected to exceed 220 billion, according to the United Nations. Nearly half of all the jobs in Africa could potentially be lost, according to the United Nations. <clears throat> so if you look at the situation in the uh, countries in the global north, wealth European governments have, yes, uh, followed the majority of the, their uh, workers, but they have compensated them in terms of income replacement. Uh, and I mean, this has been the case uh, in varying degrees in most of Europe, uh, but also in North America and to some extent in countries in Latin America. That's not the same in many parts of, uh, Af most parts of Africa and in Asia and in the Caribbean uh, and, and in Latin America. So the International Monetary Fund has already reported that pandemic is going to create perhaps the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression in the 1930s. The fund reversed earlier predictions that the global economy would grow at about 3% and instead suggested that it might contract by 3% and it might lead to a loss of close to $9 trillion in gross, in, in gross domestic product. That would have been the case with, uh, during the uh, normal times. Uh, and, and they've argued that it is a loss akin to the loss of uh, Germany and Japan's economies uh, being vanished from the, uh, the continent, uh, from, from the globe altogether. And uh, Gita Kopinath, who is the IMF's uh, chief economist, has suggested that these losses are unevenly distributed across the global north and the global south. So that one, they one really minute, locked in. Uh, one, minute, one minute to wind up. And, and even structures will have uh, a disproportionate uh, impact. Uh, the other people who have looked at this question, uh, and let me try and say this uh, very quickly, uh, uh, Leo Zilling and Hannah Cross, who have uh, uh, an article in uh, the Review of uh, African Political Economy, uh, titled Pulverized Africa, Capitalism, and COVID-19, in which they raise uh, questions about the uh, crisis being built on top of uh, an already existing what they refer to as permanent crisis that arose out of the uh, restructuring of the economies. Uh, they identify two really important things that I, I, think, I think are essential here to, uh, to mention. One is uh, that the crisis is not simply an outcome of negative aspects of globalization, uh, but that they, there's a dimension of increased viruses uh, and their impact uh, on the lives of people in, in Africa and others. They quote from uh, Rob Wallace, who has written a book called Big Farms Big, uh, Make Big Flu, in which he argues essentially that the capitalist logic of uh, production has actually created conditions, uh, not just uh, in Africa, but in other places where the emergence of these viruses is going to be a uh, commonplace. And okay, 15, 15 seconds, Dr. Garabuzi. Seconds. The other question they raise uh, is relates to uh, the uh, point that uh, the uh, professor has raised, the question of the difference, uh, the contradictions uh, in terms of uh, the, both the capitalist economy, both within and uh, across uh, the globe. The difference between the responses that the global north is, is capable of and the responses that global south uh, is capable of. I, 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 and I think that they, this uh, an opportunity for us to talk about that and talk about the implications of those differences. Thank you, um, thank you, thank you very much. I think we're at the end well, of this. I guess the last thing I want to say is. Uh, well, no, 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 no. We are at the end of this. Thank you, thank you very much. We move on. Uh, we move on to uh, uh, David. I think who is back. Uh, David Gendoshimba. Uh, yeah. Uh, I I want to thank uh, uh, Domo for reminding us of one important start of point, uh, perhaps the post-COVID, uh, I'm quoting, the post-COVID new normal is going to be characterized by automation and perhaps digitalization. Now, now that is very scary because um, whatever it means, uh, this new normal will really leave a lot of other people unpleasant. Now, uh, I think there is a very good handle of uh, the social, and the economical in the, in the paper I read, and, and I think uh, Domo has done as good to give us some very interesting case studies, particularly the one of Kerala, about how the social 
and the economic is, is handled there. But my discussion is, is really to suggest an extension of Domo's uh, 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 preoccupation to the political uh, and to the historical. So I want to extend really his, um, his inaugural conversation um, uh, about this crisis to, to think about the political, but also to look at it from the historical standpoint. So what do I mean by the political? Uh, um, of course, uh, first and foremost, uh, while epidemiological, as, as the COVID-19 crisis can be, it is not just medical science, uh, but more so politics that will take us further in eliminating the crisis. So, uh, uh, and this is important because what I've gathered in the past four weeks is that um, we as society uh, have turned to the epidemiologists to give us a final word. And the epidemiologists have really taken advantage of the moment. They have developed a big mouth with uh, very little ears. They, they speak with authority and they, they shut down everyone else. So the conversation has really been dominated by medic and, and for that matter, epidemiologists. And one is left to wonder, uh, to, to quote, to paraphrase um, uh, close of it, I think COVID crisis is too serious a matter to be left to epidemiologists alone. And, 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 and this is important for us to remember that um, the difference in terms of responses uh, uh, will be played out in the political field. And, and politics really, I mean the leadership, uh, the leadership here. Uh, 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 because what Kerala is teaching us, I, and I also suggest uh, uh, this as uh, my, my reading of the Kerala case. What Kerala, what Kerala in India teaching us is that um, uh, uh, the, the key lies in the political, how the political leadership uh, responds, and, and not necessarily what kind of advice the epidemiologist gave, but how the political leadership responds to the advice of the epidemiologist. So that is one. So we, we see, even within the medical sciences, let me emphasize this. We, we need to democratize the conversation, I think. We need to democratize the conversation about what it is that we are faced with. Uh, because epidemiologists mm -hmm. do not give us all the answers to, to this pandemic. We have pathologists who are telling us, pathologists are telling us a couple of uh, uh, interesting things. We have physiologists who are telling us some other things. And, and so to limit the conversation in the medical circles to the epidemiologists, I think is to really, and, and miss a, a, a great deal of opportunity. But, but that aside, um, uh, I, I want to emphasize the fact that we have a, a, a triad here. So we have knowledge, technology, and policy. That, that's my triad uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the readings uh, which, which Domo shared with us. So knowledge, of course, that knowledge is not just a, a, a medicino, it's not just medical, it is also you know, economic, it's also social, it's, 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 it's psychology and, and, and all that. But you also have the technology, which, which, will best, which will be based on that knowledge for you. But, but what is amiss in the, in the paper is the policy bit of it. And, and that's where the political comes in. Uh, because if, if, if we have the knowledge and we have the technology, but we still do not have a very clear sense of urgency and, 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 the, and, the, and the clarity of direction, together with uh, particularly important for this point in time is the solidarity in purpose. And, and all these two, uh, uh, these two elements, the clarity of direction and solidarity in purpose are not going to be furnished by, by knowledge and technology per se. They will be furnished by the policy orientations and the policy, the policy uh, postures we, we take vis-a-vis -vis this crisis. So uh, uh, I think uh, uh, we, we already know that the, one of the consequences of this of this pandemic will be speaking from uh, from the Africa I know uh, uh, we are we are likely to see some uh, kind of uh, predatory politics uh, coming up in the name of curbing the the, the, the pandemic that is spread uh, already some elections are going to be deferred and so transition to to this governance is going to be solved and and so uh, that is a looming danger uh, when when there is no even modicum of legitimacy to, to harness um, uh, uh, clarity of, of vision and also to, to consolidate the uh, uh, purpose. Uh, uh, that, for me, is, is a bigger problem. Even when 
even when the strategic challenges uh, uh, still remain. And I think you have given us very clearly uh, how, they, how, how, how they look like, the strategic challenges uh, pointing towards social and economic recovery. But, but, but beyond just the tactical challenges, which is really how to contain the outbreak and the, and the strategic challenges, which is about how to stop, how to look into the social and economic recovery, we also have the political challenge, how the new model, how the new normal is likely to displace legitimacy, political legitimacy from the scene, and, and we have all, all sorts of charlatans who are going to take advantage of, uh, of, of inserting themselves into the history of, 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 of human government. That, that, is, that is what I thought uh, 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 should be an extension of this conversation. Now, the second and the last point I want to make is really the historical. Uh, I don't want to claim to have been uh, working on this um, uh, topic of uh, uh, epidemics, uh, particularly pandemics, from, from a long time. But uh, my, my reading, my reading of the of, uh, of this history of pandemics, um, particularly starting from the 14th century, uh, with uh, this uh, uh, bubonic plague, uh, um, uh, which was the Black Death, uh, the, the very century in which Ibn Khaldun was uh, writing his preface to introduction to history. Mm -hmm. I, I think uh, coming from the 13th, from the 14th century through the pandemics of the 16th and the 17th century, the plague of 18th century, uh, uh, and the whole series of, uh, uh, of, of infectious diseases, uh, uh, including uh, smallpox and, 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 and varicella and, 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 and to malaria and, and sleeping disease, we, we can tell for sure that um, COVID-19 so far, COVID-19 so far is, is pale in comparison to other historical uh, pandemic monsters of, of our time. So uh, this, this should teach us one thing, that uh, perhaps the, pan the panic, the panic which we are seeing uh, um, across the globe um, needs to be, need to be one, uh, um, particularly from, uh, if we have a glass of the historical, if you have an historical glance at um, how pandemics have uh, really been catastrophic to human history. And, and this, this panic seems to be uh, uh, instrumentalized. And my question is, who is profiting from this panic? Uh, it seems there, is, there are some profiteers who, who are sustaining, um, not, only, not only through media, but also through all the scientific uh, projection we are seeing, uh, modeling of mathematic ma modeling, economic modeling, we are, we are seeing that there is a, a sustenance of this panic that, that we, are, we are facing an apocalyptic, an apocalyptic uh, uh, end. And so who is profiting from this panic? This would be a question that can help us to, to prepare ourselves how to avoid this panic. Um, uh, what the historical teaches us, it seems uh, uh, a very clear lesson. And perhaps I want uh, Jomo to return back to his uh, new green, um, uh, his Green New Deal. And, and, and I think the, 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 historical, the historical glance at the pandemic tells us that uh, the current interface, the interface between our species, we as human species, and our possible parasites, uh, has widened up. It has widened so much so that uh, the incentive for, for microbes to exploit humans has never been greater. Um, um, than now. And, and even though our ability to combat these microbes has grown so powerful, but these have been so near to us. And, and I think the, the, the question is really uh, this Anthropocene, this Anthropocene human being who has been so much in charge of the, the planet, the posture, the posturing of the Anthropocene uh, are creating unprecedented ecological damage to our planet as uh, uh, has, 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 has been the cause of uh, the nearing of the microbes to us. And so we are seeing this crossing of the boundary from the zoonic, uh, zoonic uh, 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 sectors uh, coming to the human species with all these uh, uh, infectious diseases. I think it points to an ecological crisis, a crisis which we have paid a debt here too. A crisis has been shy to, 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 to to present for what it is, and of course, these economics are not the current um, liberal uh, economic model is not really ready um, to face and so much. 
And so uh, I think uh, uh, it is important that um, we say in, in every sense, uh, this COVID-19 uh, uh, is, is, is our pandemic of our age. It, it, it is a pandemic of our age, it's a pandemic we deserve, and we deserve it, uh, 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 and I'm speaking it, we deserve it from an ecological standpoint, not a moral one, not from a moral standpoint, but ecologically speaking, this is the crisis of our age, which we deserve, and uh, it has a lot to do with um, the anthropogenic posturing, uh, which has particularly been going on since the um, Industrial Revolution. And and, and 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 so and and even uh, more galvanized um, in the aftermath of World War II. Uh, unless we really bring the ecological and uh, uh, David, uh, David, yes. David, half a minute to wind up, please. Sure. So unless we really bring the ecological and the political in the frame of uh, analysis, uh, we, we are likely to disappoint. And of course, we know that uh, uh, Paul Roma tells us that crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So I think there's never been urgency as now to really bring the climate um, justice conversation to the table. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I thank all our discussions and uh, we go back to uh, uh, Jomo for a response. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mamdani. To make things easier, I think it's best if you just refer to Jomo, uh, because I, uh, my, my late father, whose name is Sundaram, uh, would, would, would turn over in his grave listening to different pronunciations of his name. So uh, anyway, that, that is his name, not my name. So we don't ha have a family name as such. But uh, let me, let me uh, thank uh, the three discussants for their comments. and. Uh, uh, both the second and the di third discussant have made uh, general comments which I uh, would respond to, but really it's Mr. Muinga who has made the most detailed comments. Um, I would simply first, by way of a general response, uh, make uh, uh, three uh, comments before going to Mr. Muinga's uh, comments. Uh, my first general response is to insist that this time it is different. I have uh, been in positions of some responsibility in an intergovernmental organization in the UN uh, when we had to go through several uh, the SARS one, uh, 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 the SARS one, the avian flu, and a number of other uh, uh, epidemics and pandemics. Um, this time, because of the very specific character of the uh, the virus and the means by which which it infects. I have to insist that it is uh, different, and it has forced uh, um, and 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 its difference is not only in terms of the nature of infection and how uh, and how it uh, uh, it makes all of us uh, very vulnerable, uh, but also. Uh, um, uh, the, the, the insidiousness by which infection takes place, that the, you, you can be infected without knowing it. There are no, uh, that, that, that possibly over half, possibly up to about 70% of people will remain asymptomatic, although infectious and so on and so forth. Um, and um, this, all this of course has, has very, very important implications. So it has forced us to rethink many of our assumptions. And this, I, I, I think, is the, the first thing I would like to emphasize. Secondly, all three have made uh, uh, very important criticism that I did not discuss the politics of all this uh, enough. And, and it is true that I have not, be, uh, partly because uh, I, thought, uh, uh, I thought by the advocacy of the Kerala and uh, uh, approach uh, uh, was implied uh, a participatory consultative approach as opposed to uh, uh, the much more draconian approaches implied by lockdown uh, and, and so on. Uh, but I have to insist uh, that, uh, that 
when the infections have reached a certain stage, uh, there may well be not be any option but a lockdown. Uh, even then, I would still argue and insist that a lockdown become, uh, uh, should be designed uh, so as to be least uh, 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 disruptive, to be least uh, problematic for the most vulnerable. Uh, and, and so I, I think the whole question of agency and the agency of the state becomes important. I should also emphasize that um, over the last, uh, um, in the first and sec in the first part of uh, March, uh, I got involved in private debates with many old friends, all of whom were insisting on a bigger role for the state, and uh, you know they they saw the role of the state as being important uh, for all the reasons which you're all very familiar with. I don't need to to rehearse them again. But I was very, very concerned because I, I, I see the, the, the larger role for the, they were calling for the state uh, did not, uh, was not qualified. And there are many states uh, which are going to resort to, to lockdown and other draconian measures uh, who will use it for their own purposes. Uh, we see that, for example, in India uh, not, not in the state of Kerala particularly, but in India more generally. We see that in a number of other countries, in Hungary and so on and so forth. And, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, we see that in Mr. Trump's uh, uh, And I would, uh, without getting into the details of it, it's already happening in Malaysia. Because um, while most of you probably didn't, don't know, there was a coup against the uh, former Prime Minister uh, Mahathir uh, during during the during the month of, of uh, at the end of April of February, and during this period of the coup and the transition of power, uh, we lost three valuable weeks. So even though Malaysia can be counted among the early East Asian uh, uh, responders in the sense of uh, we were talking about doing tests and all that as early as the first week of Feb of January. Valuable weeks, and I have to tell you something uh, um, that I was involved in a, in an economic council uh, meeting with uh, with, uh, with the former prime minister Mahathir, where I was uh, alone in a council of about uh, twenty plus people uh, uh, in in calling for an immediate uh, increase in the funding for the Ministry of Health. Uh, I had been involved in an earlier debate uh, uh, last year and that I had lost at that time for increased funding for the health ministry uh, in, in view uh, against the, the, the uh, pr promotion of, uh, of health insurance. But in this particular case, I was very insistent on the need uh, uh, for, for increased funding for the health ministry particularly to equip itself with uh, what is called pr uh, pr personal protective equipment, as well as, as uh, much more uh, testing and, and equipment uh, measures. Now, um, some of you who are civil libertarians may, be, uh, may not like the fact that I was also calling for tracing. Tracing uh, basically is, is quite intrusive. Uh, it might be seen as against civil liberties uh, but it was extremely important. And in Malaysia, there was a religious gathering at the end of February, where, which was attended by about 16,000 people from throughout the region. About one third of them have not been traced to the present day. We are not able to, tr to identify who they are. And more than half of the confirmed infected people in Malaysia are identified with what is called the tablik cluster. Tablik refers to the religious group which met at the end of, of, of February. So I think there are very difficult issues involved in terms of democracy, in terms of human rights, in terms of civil liberties, and so on and so forth, uh, which I avoided. And I think you are all uh, quite correct in, in suggesting that I was, uh, that I, I I, I did, did not address this issue, but I think there is a real possibility 
and there's a real danger and a real threat that this crisis will be used uh, by existing governments uh, to uh, take pre abuse the prerogatives which they take upon themselves in the name of the public good, of protecting the public good. Having said that, I would um, uh, turn to Mr. Mwinga's uh, uh, comments and particularly uh, his concern about uh, the cultural leaders. Uh, the fact of the matter is that there are cultural leaders like uh, the ones in Uganda, which are all over the world. Uh, some of you may know that uh, an African-American bishop uh, passed away, died yesterday uh, from COVID-19. He was one of those who believed that uh, the protection provided by Jesus Christ would be would surmount uh, all challenges provided by. So, the, you know, this kind of thing is happening all over the world. It's not u unique to Uganda. And the question is, what do you do in this kind of situation? Now, in the case of Kerala, they, they, where they had the most consultative approach, uh, they engaged community leaders all, from the outset, from January itself. And before introducing measures, they had consulted with uh, with, uh, with uh, community leaders. And this, I think, is a very important uh, point which was raised uh, by Mr. Mwinga's comments, the need for consultation. But the fact of the matter remains that although the science, much, many aspects of the science of, the, of, the, uh, of this infection is, are still unknown. And I don't think, I, I do not want to pretend as if I know more and, and, and I'm sure even scientists themselves would agree that there are many questions which are disputed. I think it is important to recognize that there are people who are intent on, who, on, on believing what they choose to believe, um, uh, whether it is uh, the, the fact that their faith uh, will prevail or that uh, this crisis is being exaggerated uh, for, for nefarious uh, ends and so on and so forth. I would say that it is, it may be exaggerated in certain circumstances for particular ends, and I'm not discounting that. But I think it is very important to recognize that in this kind of situation, um, uh, uh, what does it mean to be respectful of people's cultural preferences? What does it mean to, be re to, 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 to insist uh, on embracing your elders, uh, your grandparents, or your parents, and so on and so forth. These are very difficult questions. You may be putting them at risk, and uh, this has already happened uh, in, on multiple occasions in different parts of the world. Um, now, let me uh, uh, move to, 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 um, to, to I, I, I think uh, Mr. Minga may, may um, I, I only sent, uh, because of Professor Mamdani's advice, I, I, I sent about 5,000 words, okay? Uh, but I did not uh, share with you much of what I have written. I've written uh, a great deal, for example, about, I, ha I have a little book on globalization and development in Af Africa, which is uh, quite critical. But I think to be, to be quite blunt about it, um, uh, globalization had, was stopped in its tracks uh, about a dozen years ago with the global financial crisis. So we have continued financial globalization, which bypasses much of sub-Saharan Africa, because these are not considered countries which are emerging market economies. But in end, there has not been any significant expansion of, of, of world trade. Uh, and many people lament, okay, the conventional uh, mainstream economists lament that Africa is coming on, this, on board too late to participate in the global uh, supply chains and value chains and so on and so forth. Regardless of one's sentiments on those kinds of issues, I do think that, that what is likely to happen after this crisis is that there will be a greater emphasis on national supply chains. This has already been led by Mr. Mr. Trump, but it's also being led by Mr. Abe, in the Prime Minister of, of Japan, uh, who has uh, asked all Japanese companies uh, especially those companies which are which are high tech companies to move back to Japan. Uh, so uh, we we uh, uh, we are likely to see uh, much more national supply chains rather than international supply chains, uh, let alone the global supply chain possibilities which the World Bank and others have been holding out to African countries. Um, 
now so so um, but what will it mean for example in terms of uh, long distance uh, uh, travel for some countries which are sp spatial uh, what does it mean in terms of uh, physical uh, you know transportation of goods sensors what does it mean in terms of uh, are we all going to be better off if we return to a much more rustic life where we produce our own food requirements and so on these are very difficult questions uh, Mr. Uh, Professor uh, 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 Golobuzi uh, raised the question of, of, uh, of, of the so-called African Green Revolution, which I've been quite critical of. For those of you, uh, I didn't circulate this article, but I, I wrote and I published an article last week uh, against uh, Agra, uh, Mr. 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 Uh, what's his name? Uh, Bill Gates uh, Agra. Okay, and I, I, before he passed away a lot, about uh, almost a decade ago, I actually had a lot of discussions with my former boss, uh, Kofi Annan, about uh, his role in, in, in Agra. And, in, and, and I was very pleased, uh, I, was very, uh, I was very pleased when he resigned his, chair, his chairmanship uh, of, the, of Agra uh, 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 about, about eight years ago. Or maybe more than that. Um, so, so, um, so the, the the question of what what food security will mean will be redefined. What we have seen in many of our countries has been a heavy emphasis on uh, the three privileged uh, uh, source of calories, the carbohydrates, and a great neglect of of uh, of uh, other sources of, of more balanced nutrition. And I tried to work when I was working uh, briefly at the, at the Food and Agriculture Organization. I tried to work with the African Union and, and others uh, 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 to try to, to, to put uh, nutrition uh, on the agenda. Because in so many of our societies now, you have uh, problems of obesity and, and, and uh, overweight, uh, which, um, and, and also related problems of excessive use consumption of, of salt and, and, and sugar and so on and so forth. So these are all very important problems uh, which, which have been raised uh, by Mr. Golobuzi's uh, uh, comments. Uh, but if I may go back to, to uh, Mr. Winger's comments, I think um, uh, perhaps um, uh, it might have been, I, I, I use the terminology, I always qualified with inverted commas of the new normal. Okay, because that's how um, most people are talking about it. But I do not personally envisage a single new normal. Uh, that, that would be so naive. There is no single new, there's no single old normal for that matter, and there's not going to be a single new normal. But the fact of the matter remains that things are not going to be the same anymore. And what, how much the change will be, or how little the change will be, will depend very much on human agency. And this is precisely the reason why I'm appealing to all of you who are engaged in, in trying to, to, to think about these issues, to inform uh, uh, social change agendas, and to, in seeing the, the specific opportunities uh, of this moment in order to, to further agendas. Uh, it would be relatively easy, for example, uh, to push for, for, for strengthened funding for public health systems it would be very relatively easier uh, to insist uh, on uh, funding of public health systems uh, as neglected as they have been all this time. Um, but it will be much, much more difficult, for example, to try to promote, uh, say, renewable energy. Uh, it will be much, much more difficult to try to promote uh, food safety uh, types of issues because of the excessive use of toxic agrochemicals and so on and so forth. Yomo, Yomo, one more minute and you'll have a chance to come back later several times. Okay, yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm not sure, sure I have no interest in the informal sector, but uh, let, let me leave that aside. And I don't think I have a fetish about, the, about sustainable development, uh, uh, but I think it is very important to, to recognize that it is one of the few things the so-called leaders of the world have agreed on and the, 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 the whole challenge right now, it seems to me, is to try to move the agenda and elaborate the agenda in ways uh, which, which, are, which are going to be useful uh, in terms of getting people to rethink how society 
uh, is doing. Um, and uh, so as far as the, you know, things like homogeneity about uh, and so on and so forth, Mr. Uh, I would simply encourage you, I think those are very fair criticisms, uh, Mr. Moinga, but I would encourage you to, to, to read some of the other things that I may have written on some of these subjects uh, before drawing too hasty a conclusion on that. But I think the, the important thing really is that, that we have a new opportunity here. But we are not going to, 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 to be able to change the discourse simply by, by, ex, by simply re, regurgitating our old slogans. There is much which is new about this challenge which we face together in the world today. And I think we really need to come to grips with it in order to be, to be able to make a difference in terms of how we change the conversation going forward. Let me stop here, Professor Mandel. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jomo. Um, before we take a break, a uh, couple of guidelines about uh, when we come back. Uh, so when we come back, we'll have roughly an hour of a question and answer session. Uh, the session will unfold in several cycles. Each cycle uh, comprising uh, uh, three questions or comments. So those of you who want to uh, uh, who have a question or, or want to make a comment, uh, please send me on the chat your name and your institutional affiliation. Okay, you will have two minutes. Um, Javi will uh, mute you after two minutes. Uh, he has better technical skills than I do. Um, and then at the end of the three comments, uh, uh, Professor Jomo Kwame Sundaram will, uh, will have a chance to respond and then we'll go on to the next set of three comments. So on for an hour. I suggest we take a 10 minute break now, health break, whatever break you want to take, just stretch yourself. We're going to begin with a set of three questions. The first one from uh, Anna Kartik at Miser. Second from Adventino Banjua at Miser. And the third from Marion Oma, uh, uh, chair of research, of chair of uh, social policy uh, in uh, South African research organization. Um, Anna. Thank you, Professor. Um, uh, Professor Sundaram, thank you so much for uh, the presentation. I am uh, myself a Carolite. Um, I just want a couple of comments concerning Kerala in particular. Um, so we'll talk about what has happened in the context of COVID, but um, I'm not sure if you've taken into consideration the fact that Canada has been an economic um, outlier in the sense that um, it is one of the most uh, extensive democratic decentralization programs in the world. Uh, so I have always benefited from the system of that state, despite not living in that state for more than 20, 25 years of my life. Um, also, the fact that um, how housing has been used um, through extensive cyber surveillance uh, system, and um, also, um, if I could use the uh, binary of uh, public, the political society and the civil society used by Professor Chatterjee, um, has been uh, almost rendered to uh, the Kerala's context because of a socially conscious populace to whom the state feels, the, the government, uh, the political setup feels more responsible. So, um, for example, um, two, three days ago, my grandmother tried to step outside her home just for a walk within her property. Former police patrolling uh, just came to inquire why she stepped out, which means there's constant drone surveillance going on. Um, the while, um, well, uh, while all the other things are put in place, there is extensive surveillance, there is a, uh, extensive tracing, but all the historiography socially that has helped throughout the last couple of decades in preparing the state to face such a pandemic with its healthcare system. And of course, as you said, the migration to the Gulf, uh, which has brought um, um, re remittances uh, for like Kerala to have attain its human development index in relation to developed countries in the world. So thank you so much. Adventino? Yeah, 
Yeah, thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Jomo, for the presentation and for the discussion. And thank you also uh, for such wonderful discussion. I have one question to Professor. Um, so one critique coming out from this presentation is a critique of one size fits all. So the critique of the lockdowns as they have been globalized. So my, my question is, uh, don't you think this COVID moment presents us an opportunity also to rethink these pre-existing global visions like the Agenda 2030, which Professor is trying also to say that we can advance it uh, even within this COVID moment. So is this not also an opportunity to rethink these visions? Thank you. Thank you. Marianne, Oma. Um, um, thank you. Um, I think it's clear that um, no country was prepared for the pandemic. So the effects, as you can see, it's going to be quite catastrophic. And uh, my question to uh, Professor is, uh, in your view, which countries do you think will emerge better uh, from this pandemic? And here I'm thinking about uh, the role of the welfare state and thinking about countries that have adopted broader instruments than um, cash, cash transfers, for example, broader instruments of, uh, of social policy than just cash transfers and income replacement. And I think in particular here, I'm thinking about the Nordic, uh, the Nordic countries like Sweden and Denmark, their response to the pandemic, but also how they, we, they may emerge because they have broader social policy instruments, how they may emerge from the pandemic. But also, and then I think a second question I would like to ask is, um, is there opportunity, what window of opportunity has presented for us to maybe for advocacy for, for broader social policy in Africa than cash transfers, the cash transfer narrative that we keep on hearing about? Thank you. Thank you. Professor Jomo Kwame Sundaram. I think uh, Anna's opening remarks uh, on uh, decentralization uh, uh, are not really intended to evoke any particular response from me. Uh, but I, I, I do think uh, um, my, 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 my point really about uh, Kerala is that it, it really is uh, uh, a society with uh, very limited resources. Firstly, it is quite poor. There might be remittances, but the remittances do not go into the public coffers. So the resources available to the state government are very, very limited. And, uh, I, and many, for many uh, sub-Saharan African countries, um, the situation may be comparable. So that's why I think Kerala is extremely important of course, uh, you, uh, you know, this whole question of how, how much surveillance there is and so on and so forth and how to, and, um, how to enforce and, and so on. I, you know, this anecdotal stuff, I, I don't know how to handle. Uh, I, I've been reading quite a bit of, uh, of uh, uh, on, on Kerala and I didn't even know about this uh, drone surveillance being used for, uh, for, 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 for physical distancing purposes. Uh, but um, at the mass level, I think what is important is, is actually a very significant success in, 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 in encouraging people. And this is the difference about the Kerala experience and the, and the Vietnam experience, that the whole society has been mobilized. In fact, uh, the, the Prime Minister of Vietnam, for example, refers to the effort against COVID-19 as comparable to the Tet Offensive. Most of you may not remember what the Tet Offensive is, but uh, Mahmoud Mamdani, I'm sure, will remember what the Tet Offensive. It was the turning point uh, in the Vietnam War, where it became very clear that the, that the US was not going to be able to prevail. And the Tet, of course, is the Lunar New Year. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, th this whole crisis basically um, uh, uh, expands during this particular period. Uh, so on this, um, on the, on the point that Adventino makes, I think I completely share his sentiment. Uh, I don't think one size fits all uh, was, really, uh, was really something which people took very, I mean, I, I don't think, I, I think people were lazy, you know, uh, if the, when the IMF and the World Bank and, other, and, and 
all the consultants uh, who come to our societies, you know, it's so much easier to 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 uh, take something from another country and just change, you know, do a search function, change Uganda to uh, change, uh, say, Kenya and put Uganda instead of Kenya or something like that, you know. But but realistically speaking, at the at the national level, there's always room for 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 national. Uh, uh, discretion and so on. So I wouldn't be too worried about one size fits all, but I think your point is really very important because it really uh, underscores the importance of, for example, uh, elaborating the social development agenda as it is relevant to our own societies. In certain societies, which are, for example, where are much more electrified, there is really no need for significant electrification. If you already have uh, 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 very good public health systems, uh, then then perhaps that is not such a priority. Or if um, th there is much more concern about the ecology in in, in uh, that that is obviously uh, becomes uh, less relevant. But in many of the, the the point really is that the 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 sustainable development agenda offers a broad range of cons covers a broad range of concerns. It's not comprehensive, but these were hard fought struggles to try to, for example, to bring attention to, to uh, questions of inequality, for example. As you may remember, uh, in the Millennium Development Goals, there was, hard, there was no mention of inequality. The emphasis was simply on poverty. That was the way the World Bank approached the world, and the World Bank was able to prevail uh, when, the world, when the Millennium Development Goals go, uh, were written. But, but when, when the sustainable development goals, it was a much more consultative process. Everybody will complain about why 17 sustainable development goals, such a clumsy number, and so on. And that's what, you know, um, uh, you know, democracy and consultation is never very elegant and very smooth and so on. So you don't have the Ten Commandments or, or something like that. But, you know, that, that, so thank you for that point, Adventina. The last point with Mariana Noma, if I, I hope I didn't mispronounce it. Um, I think the achievement, I mean, uh, you, you brought up the Nordic countries and I think the greatest, uh, the highest level of testing now, when I wrote my article on, on, uh, on uh, uh, East Asia and highlighting the case of uh, Korea, um, at that stage, Korea had the highest level of testing in the world. Um, now, um, and the second highest, by the way, was uh, Guangdong province, uh, Guangdong city uh, in South China. Uh, today, uh, Korea is probably number number five, and uh, uh, Norway is number one. Um, and ahead of Korea now is Singapore, but Singapore is now um, uh, because it neglected the question of uh, migrant workers, and and. <coughs> A new outbreak now of uh, COVID-19 among uh, among uh, migrant work workers, um, and and so what 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 has happened is been there has been a, no a lockdown uh, imposed in Singapore, which never had a lockdown before. So if you take out Wuhan city and the three provinces around Wuhan city, the first lockdown in East Asia is actually uh, in Singapore. Uh, uh, now it has, it has not been any lockdown in 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 in, in Japan, uh, mm -hmm. certainly not in Korea. So, uh, even in the most infected city, the city of Daegu, uh, where there was a religious cult uh, which was spreading the virus uh, because of its practices, they were slightly secretive. They they thought of themselves as being oppressed by the by the state and so on and so forth, and they were doing a lot of things uh, on the sly. And this was. Part of the reason why the, 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 they, they were the, the epicenter. But I think the achievements of relatively rich countries like Norway uh, really pales into insignificance when you compare it with the achievement of, of let us say, um, uh, Kerala uh, or, 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 or uh, uh, Vietnam. Uh, the fact that they have been able to contain the whole problem. Also, we don't know how much uh, um, has spread uh, in, in a place like Norway. Uh, so um, one of the points uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Moinga raised earlier 
was the was the question of of uh, testing, uh, and and uh, um, you know one of the big big problems about looking at the data about how many infected cases of infection are is that we don't know the level. And the level of testing, of course, has to do uh, with the, the suspected level of infe infe infection and so on. So the fact that, that Korea uh, imposed a requirement of paying over 100 bucks um, has to do with, uh, with, uh, with the fact that you know, anybody who could, anybody who was demanding, everybody was demanding that they be tested. And Korean resources, uh, although higher than most of uh, our countries uh, are not unlimited. And so they impose this thing that if there was no positive result, uh, you wouldn't get your money back. Uh, in, in, if you insisted, if you were suspected or you were traced, then you, 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 you would get tested regardless of whether you, whether you, you, you wanted, uh, whether, whether you wanted to be tested. But if you insisted on being tested, I'll give you a, uh, an example. I have somebody who was assisting me and uh, because I had been to Korea in the early February, um, his family insisted that he be tested. And he went around trying to get tested and so on and so forth. Finally, he got a private facility to test him. And the private facility, of course, charged him. Um, and that's precisely, you know, it was because the family was so insistent because he, he, he came into uh, contact with me. Uh, and all... My, my big thing was, was having been in the country of Korea, where the city where the infections were, were actually quite far away. So, you know, you, so you, you have people who, because of class privilege, because they have the means of demanding testing, and you just cannot afford to give everybody the test, that, that becomes a rationing uh, a device. The other point uh, which uh, Marianne Numa raised is the question of uh, social policy. And I think, uh, I, uh, ironically, uh, in the present situation, I actually am supportive of, uh, of, ca of, of cash transfers. I have been very, very critical of cash transfers in the past. And I've been very much in favor of, uh, uh, of, of other mean types of social protection. But in the present situation, uh, where people, especially the, the Poorest in society, the, the, the two, group, two main groups I referred to earlier, the, uh, the, the daily rated uh, workers and, and those who are self-employed, uh, because very few people can afford to remain unemployed for a long time in, in our societies. Those people have very little choice. Uh, uh, for, for them, uh, social policy in, in normal circumstances is quite different. But in this normal situation where they just have no... No, no income on a daily basis, and they're struggling so, to survive. The easiest way to disperse, uh, to provide social protection is actually to, to provide, uh, provide them with cash. So, um, so ironically, I, I am supporting uh, cash transfers in this very exceptional situation, but I agree with your plea that we have to think about social policy and so, social protection on a much more extended basis, because especially in this situation, there are going to be there's going to be a lot of talk about uh, the ins about uh, about targeting. Uh, there's going to be a lot of talk about uh, about uh, what do you call it uh, uh, social safety nets and 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 such like, and and the principles of social protection, which tend to be more universal and so on and so forth, uh, are very important for us to uphold. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, the next three comments, questions, uh, come from uh, Dr. Samson Bezabe at uh, Miser. And the second questioner will be uh, Tutu Zelekeni Mwimbi, uh, University of Western Cape in South Africa. And the third questioner is uh, Grace Maria Cantero, Cantaro, uh, Kentaro, uh, School of Women and Gender Studies, Makerere University. Uh, Dr. Samson Bezabe, please. Um, thank you for this interesting presentation. Uh, my, my focus really uh, is on the issue of methodology or of how to do research 
within the context of, um, of the situation that we are in and the knowledge production of this. Um, because there was um, a debate on the return of armchair anthropology like five years ago within, within my discipline. And of course, armchair anthropology was how things started. So uh, uh, the, is this the implication that we are facing? Is this a reality? Uh, and of course, uh, because now, you know, the traditional fieldwork is, is made impossible. So I, I would be very happy if you can comment on that. Um, and of course, this also relates with how um, the Trump's accusation to, to WHO, because his, his accusation is, is basically is that, um, uh, to put it crudely, is that WHO has not done its own research in China, and now he has cut the funding. Uh, so again, it's, it's, it has to do with this aspect of going in and getting data and so on. So what, what would be your, your view, one, on, on this research uh, and COVID, and second, on, on also on Trump's and, and, and his assertions on China? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sorry, we'll have to come back to you later. Uh, too many echoes. Uh, maybe you relocate yourself. Grace from Women and Gender, Makerere. My observation is... Hello? Yes, yes. please continue. Yes, my observation is uh, most governments, especially my government, have not put in place the policies that are responding to the gendered impact of COVID-19. And for example, uh, when I react to the president's uh, address yesterday on the, 20, uh, uh, on the 21 measures, you find that he has not catered, I'm um, from the School of Men and Gender, first of all, the president has not catered for the mothers, for example, when he puts on the lockdowns and the curfews at night, and he's uh, stopping the motorists from operating, and he's telling people that you're supposed to ask for permission from RDCs, it means that the mothers who are about to give birth uh, and the children inside their wombs are going to get tired and die by the time they seek for permission. Uh, my question is, how can we make these governments uh, become gender responsive in everything that they said? For example, when they are setting measures, they are putting uh, lockdowns and curfews, they are treating and diagnosing patients of COVID-19. Uh, we look at uh, the health sector where the women uh, the majority, for example, 70% of the health sector, the employees are women. And and these women are suffering from a triple burden. You find that a woman is a mother at home, she's a wife at home. At the same time, she has to take care of COVID-19 uh, patients. And it, at the same time, she's prone to these infections. So my question to Professor Jomo, how can we make our governments, especially the government of Uganda, become gender responsive in their policies? Thank you, Professor Mom. Professor Jomo. Um, to, to Zelikeni, I have uh, I've sent you a message saying, please uh, type your question on chat and I will read it. Uh, so in the meantime, we can go to uh, uh, Professor Jomo Kwame Sundaram to give us a response to these two comments. Jomo? Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm afraid I'm going to be quite uh, disappointing to both the, the questions. Uh, uh, partly because uh, I, I think uh, the, the questions raised, uh, they, they, because, because, well, let me, let me try to, uh, Dr. Samsung raised the question of uh, what, what does it mean for research in our times? And that's a very, very important uh, uh, question, needless to say. Uh, I, I'm not sure about what uh, armchair anthropologists uh, uh, you're referring to, so I'm, I'm obviously out of touch with the debates which are going on uh, in, in, in Uganda and perhaps more generally in Africa as far as armchair anthropology is concerned. But I do think um, there, there is a tremendous amount of, of work which is needed uh, in these times, including work uh, which, which is accumulated from, uh, from past work 
um, which is, I guess, what, what armchair anthropologists do, uh, in terms of trying to, to ensure, uh, to, to think about uh, how, how we, we need to, 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 to change uh, our lifestyles uh, in ways which would be, uh, which would be precautionary uh, in terms of limiting uh, the, 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 the likelihood of, of tra transmission and infection. Uh, th this, it seems to me, is unavoidable, uh, even if a, a vaccine is uh, discovered uh, within the, within uh, within the, before the before the end of this year, for example, um, uh, and tested and so on and so forth, and and we go and it, it is it is used uh, controversially without sufficient testing or the normal uh, type of testing, um, even if that is the case. Uh, uh, we all know that uh, it took years and years and years uh, before, for example, uh, polio uh, uh, vaccination uh, what became universalized. And, and even now, uh, in parts of, of Pakistan, in parts of Nigeria, uh, northern Nigeria, uh, there, there is still not, uh, no polio vaccination. Likewise, with, with smallpox vaccination. So how do we ensure uh, the, 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 the adoption of these, uh, of these vaccines if they are proven to be the case. But my fear, as I expressed earlier, is that it's very likely uh, if, it is, if the first vaccines are developed in the West, um, that there will be a, a corporate uh, appropriation of the rights, and uh, this will be quite unaffordable to, for many, many poor countries. Likewise with the cure. Uh, the second question you raise is a very important question. There are a lot of accusations. Um, if you if you if you uh, if you read the, the, what's on the internet, uh, you will find a lot of accusations that, uh, for example, the, that that the COVID was uh, in, was created in China due uh, due to the, the the practices of the wet markets, uh, or uh, more sinister, uh, that due to uh, it escaped from some kind of secret. Uh, uh, military uh, biological warfare lab, and so on and so forth. And you also find, uh, conversely, uh, similar accusations being made about the U.S. Uh, that, that that this uh, this was actually a, a virus which was in, developed in the U.S. and uh, it was actually introduced in uh, in Wuhan uh, by a military group of about 300. Uh, who visited Wuhan uh, in the around uh, September, October last year, and so on and so forth. You know, th these are unverifiable, and I would like to know the answers of, to this. But so far, the 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 uh, the evidence seems to suggest that this happened uh, through natural mutation. It's not even clear that it happened at a wet market. Uh, of course, animal rights uh, activists and so on are trying to insist that it happened to an animal, and we can well uh, we can well uh, debate the merits or demerits of of uh, of uh, you know uh, restricting uh, uh, wet markets. Uh, but for many people in developing countries, those are the main areas where where livestock is is bought bought and 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 uh, is slaughtered and bought. So, you know, these, these are very difficult questions which are, are culturally sensitive. But the more important question right now uh, is, as you know, uh, there is an election going on. Uh, and the, 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 there's an election campaign going on. And uh, uh, the, 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 the Trump, uh, President Trump is uh, been at the highest popular popularity ratings uh, ever. Um, and uh, on the other hand, uh, um, uh, what is increasingly clear uh, is that the legitimacy and of his uh, of his response to the COVID nineteen crisis is very much uh, being challenged. It's not only being challenged by the Democratic Party, but it's also being challenged increasingly by some of the some voices in his own administration, and uh, he and and he. Uh, so, um, so the question the question is then: How do you explain away the problems in the U in the U.S. response? And the so the narrative currently 
is that uh, the Chinese uh, hid a lot of information. Uh, frankly, I have been paying attention to this problem since the end of last year. Um, so, uh, and I, I know that this information was became available to the public uh, by the end of last year, uh, especially when uh, President Xi Jinping uh, criticized uh, uh, the, the local authorities in Wuhan. So a lot of this information became available that the sequencing uh, of the virus also became uh, publicly available and was shared by the Chinese authorities with others. So, uh, <clears throat> so you, you have a lot of variations of this uh, going around and I suspect a lot of it is to blame, uh, to blame uh, 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 China. But uh, in addition now, what has happened is that uh, there is now a broader attack on Dr. Tedros the head of the WHO, who happens to be uh, uh, an Ethiopian. And uh, um, uh, many of you probably don't remember, but uh, th three years ago when he was running for election, there, it became a North-South thing. He was supported by the South uh, and <clears throat> the candidate against him who garnered uh, 50 votes eventually uh, was very much from the North. And, uh, and, and in a sense, uh, it is settling all scores to some extent. Uh, but uh, Dr. Tedros has very cleverly appointed uh, his rival as uh, the, the ambassador to uh, on, on COVID-19. So they, they, Dr. David Navarro is now the ambassador on COVID-19. A very smart move on Dr. Tedros' part, but that has not saved him from incurring the wrath of the, of the US because he has consistently praised the Chinese government for being very, very cooperative, not only in terms of sharing information as soon as it became available, but also in terms of um, uh, sharing information of the disease and helping in many other countries. Of course, you know also that besides uh, China, uh, Cuba has also been quite exemplary sending, sending uh, 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 volunteers, uh, doctors, uh, even to uh, its former colonial power uh, to Spain. Uh, besides, uh, besides uh, uh, Italy, uh, so it's 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 really uh, uh, quite uh, uh, so. B Cuba, uh, China, and Vietnam, uh, sort of the the nasty people from the Cold War, uh, are, are now coming out looking very good. So there is almost an ideological battle uh, uh, in, implicit in some of this. I don't want to say too much about this because. This thing is unfolding even as we speak. So, so, uh, but, but I think it is very interesting and very important for us to keep village vigilant and uh, to recognize the political circumstances in which we find ourselves. And my expectation is that it's very difficult to excuse away, to explain away uh, the, the the delayed U.S. response. Um, you know, even after the U.K. changed course. Uh, by, by, uh, by when after the Imperial College uh, of London uh, report, the U.S. Uh, re uh, didn't change course at, at, in Washington. Um, the, the Center for Disease Control, U.S. In, uh, mi uh, military intelligence, U.S. Uh, NSA were all warning about this uh, since early January. But uh, the White House itself, of course, as we know, didn't change course. And Dr. Fauci, to his credit, uh, his, the main advisor on infectious diseases to the, to the Trump administration has, has, has been very, very diplomatic uh, in trying to state, the, in trying to be honest uh, with, uh, but at the same time to, to retain his position uh, in, in the, the task force. Um, the other uh, question uh, raised by Grace is about, uh, about uh, uh, gender, uh, responsiveness. Um, you know, Grace, this is, I, I, I very much appreciate your question about the, the, the fact that most of our governmental systems, including our public health systems, are usually typically very gender insensitive. insensitive. Uh, in the present situation, um, I, would, I would be more hesitant to make this the big uh, uh, issue because uh, the, by, by a long shot, uh, the number of deaths attributed to COVID-19 of males is almost double 
uh, the number of deaths uh, to females. There are of, of, uh, of explanations for this. I don't know what to believe about the X chromosome, the Y chromosomes, and, and all kinds of things like that. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to dignify any of that because a lot of it is, is, is you know, people uh, speaking without any, without any serious science behind it. But uh, I think your, your question about the fact that, your, your point about the fact that most healthcare workers are, 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 are women, and especially the, the, the nurses, who are usually uh, far more in number and, and uh, also very, very uh, uh, more likely to be prone to, to, to uh, inadequate uh, uh, personal protective equipment and so on and so forth. So, and a very important emphasis, uh, for example, in the response here uh, uh, in, in uh, Malaysia and, and elsewhere has been emphasized that the PPE, the personal protective equipment, um, be guaranteed for all healthcare workers, not just for uh, for uh, for doctors. And uh, we have had a, a number of incidents where, unfortunately, people have not been forthcoming, have not been willing to disclose information. So there was a pregnant woman who was who was who was uh, later found to be positive. Uh, she came in, wanted to deliver a baby, refused to, refused to 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 to, to admit uh, uh, that she was uh, she was she was uh, she might be positive, and uh, the result was that the entire uh, the entire ward had to be closed off uh, in the hospital. So so it's it's a very very delicate situation. What does it uh, you know? But. But I, I, I think, I take your point that there is a great deal of need for greater gender sensitivity. I, I, I should say also that uh, the, the stress on women as a pr primary caregivers at, at home is also very, very uh, uh, accentuated by the fact that people are, are limited to, to uh, are, are restricted to the home. Uh, in, in China and in other societies, there seems to be some evidence that there has actually been an increase in the demands for divorce uh, following uh, lockdowns. Uh, so th these are all uh, important uh, issues to be to be un better understood and researched. Uh, but I think your your point about gender sensitivity is something which is which is uh, to be to be to be to be addressed at all times and not simply in the in the context of the COVID nineteen challenge. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're coming to, uh, I think we have another uh, 25 minutes. Um, so I'm, I'm going to uh, allow for five comments this time so that uh, our speaker can bunch them together and, and, and respond to the main points rather than to each individual uh, commentator. So the first, is from uh, uh, Juliet Chiguli of the School of Public Health at Macrera University. Um, the second is from Gizao, uh, Iyasu Gizao uh, at, uh, at Miser. Uh, the third is from Juliet Kushabe, a student at uh, Miser. Uh, fourth, Yosef, uh, also a student at uh, Miser. We'll take four because there is somebody called Emmanuel and I can't figure out where this person is from. So Emmanuel, you might want to identify your institutional uh, affiliation. So shall we begin with uh, Juliet Chiguli? Juliet. Yeah, um, thank you, Professor Mamdani. And thank you, um, Professor Jomo, for such a wonderful and um, uh, stimulating uh, presentation. My question is um, um, uh, that we've formed organizations like Afrohun, Zehun, which Zehun is for Asia and Afrohun is for the One Health Structure within Africa. And we are trying to control the pandemic, but in this sense, I see that the COVID-19 as a pandemic is like a war rather than a mere infectious disease. So my question is, um, how would we confront um, this? Because we are seeing blocks of power, we are seeing China, and it has a big role in Africa, 
And this time, the disease moving from China to, uh, uh, from Wuhan um, in Hubei State to other places like uh, Europe and the USA, and then we see South Africa, and then we see some of the Africa, other African countries. So I see a block of power, and I also I see stigmatization and the rise of uh, borders and boundaries and also the disease moving from the global north, for example, to the south. Um, and then you talk about um, um, physical distancing rather than social distancing. So how does all this fit into um, the context of power and control and also in terms of response to the disease? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Yasu Gizao. Thank you, Professor Mamdani. Um, thank you, Professor uh, Jomo, for your uh, discussions. Uh, my question is, um, to whom are we making this appeal? Uh, to whom, for example, it is the same people, the, the, the public health infrastructure, um, the loss of entitlement, including jobs, including the provision of housing, these were denied by regimes across the world. So these are the, we have the same the same regimes in place who have uh, denied entitlements, who have destroyed uh, public health infrastructures in favor of, for example, uh, expanding security repressive systems. So to, uh, and the markets uh, supporting working with them. So I see this. Um, as, a, as a concern for me. And also you have neglected refugees. For example, last, last yesterday we have heard Saudi Arabia, other countries are also deporting migrant workers. You, you have also neglected, for example, the, the health infrastructure destroyed by the Americans in Libya, in, in Iraq, in, um, in uh, Yemen, the sanctions on, 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 on Korea. Uh, the, the sanction against Iraq, against Cuba, which is actually which you mentioned. So I think uh, we have a lot to, to include. And then this debate on treatment and vaccine. The treatment and the vaccine. Uh, there is the issue of capitalism again, because they are fighting for funds in the name of uh, making, uh, providing treatment and vaccine. So how do you view them? And uh, this issue of, um, this issue of uh, the disease is a new form of disease, especially you say the way it infects people. But I see it like any other infectious people, like malaria, like HIV AIDS, which affect uh, uh, particularly Africans. So do you think uh, this media coverage, this attention, is it because it also affects people in the West? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Juliet from Miser. No, Juliet. Yosef. Uh, um, I have okay, one. Please. Okay. Thank you, Professor Jomo and uh, Miser, for giving us this opportunity to share um, our thoughts on this uh, key debate. I have a quick question on. Um, the question of democratizing um, the strategies to curb COVID, I wonder how these would, uh, would work in terms of the time, the time that it takes for the virus to spread. If we decided to consult the different stakeholders involved or the different people that want to get uh, information from what is at stake. And then um, the other one is a comment. I think I'm very happy with the fact that we acknowledge the fact that uh, lockdown is understood differently and also it works differently in different contexts. Because from what I've seen or what I gather from the different spaces that I'm engaging with right now, um, lockdown seems to uh, be implemented at different levels. Some countries have implemented lockdown, especially when they feel like the spread is really pretty fast. But also in the context of Africa, Uganda precisely, we've had this lockdown before we even know uh, whether we have cases in the country or not. So I acknowledge the fact that um, it needs to be uh, appreciated 
at those levels contextually. And I like the fact that the professor is really speaking to that question in ways that speak to me as well, um, based on the experiences that I've had so far. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joseph from Miser. Joseph, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay. Um, I have a, a simple, a very general question. Uh, I was comparing last week's seminar with this one. So I was thinking last week's seminar was about the market and capital. And today's seminar is uh, on the state. Uh, the question I was thinking is, uh, what's the lesson of COVID-19 uh, concerning this question that uh, which one emerged more or less potent, the state or the market, uh, the political or the economy? Uh, so I'm thinking of uh, lockdown, welfare, rule by decree. So if we keep all these things in mind, uh, maybe the state is more powerful at crisis situations like this. So if you can comment on that, thank you. Thank you very much. We return to our speaker, uh, Professor Jomo Kwame Sundaram. Thank you very much uh, for all those uh, comments and questions. I, um, since we are uh, time constrained, allow me to um, try to, uh, um, uh, I, I think it's very difficult to, to, um, to give very succinct answers to some of the big questions which have been raised. So let me, uh, say in response to Yusuf's uh, uh, question that uh, obviously the, 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 the question of leaving it to the market uh, doesn't even arise. Nobody seriously thinks that the market is going to solve this problem. So, uh, um, so it's, it's, it's an easy one. Yeah? But having said that, uh, it raises the question of what is an appropriate state response? And, and uh, this is the challenge, is it? And th this is what, what, uh, what, what, uh, what we have been grappling with uh, today. Um, uh, Gizau uh, raised a lot of questions about all kinds of things which I have uh, omitted. Uh, it's it's quite, uh, quite correct. I, I, I didn't talk about the whole world and I did talk about everything which uh, is tangentially uh, related. I have to focus on something in the space of a few minutes and uh, I should emphasize that Professor Mamdani was actually initially skeptical of this choice of a subject because it's not something which I've written about extensively. I'm still struggling to understand these issues, but I feel it's a very pressing issue, a very urgent issue, and something which we really need to come to terms with in our lives. Uh, and particularly those of you in Africa are in a position to take preemptive action because what is common about all those countries which have been able to address this problem well uh, is precisely the fact of early action. Early action and adequate early action. And uh, whether it is a, a relatively well-to-do country uh, in East Asia, which did a lot of testing and, and tracing and so on and so forth, or relatively poor countries like, uh, uh, like uh, Vietnam and, and, and Kerala, where where the means are very limited, but they have been able to take a lot of precautionary measures. And uh, so far, uh, uh, so far they've have been able to, to meet with some success. So I think there are some important lessons to be, to be learned from that. Uh, whether, you know, obviously, the, we presume that the whole context is that of capitalism. We presume that the whole context is that of, of, uh, of uh, relations which cross borders as well as uh, relations within borders. And we also take for granted that, uh, you know, instead of spending the money on, on waging a war against, against, uh, against uh, uh, Yemen, 
uh, you know, resources have been wasted, uh, you know, for, for fighting with Yemen when, when so much more is needed, particularly for, for the poor Arab states and so on. We also take for granted that, that, that uh, you know, that, uh, you know, that, that uh, what happened to Muammar Gaddafi was a, a tremendous betrayal. But this is things I, I, you know, I don't think need to be reiterated anytime we talk about any subject in the world. And, and I, I, so I, I have sort of uh, uh, moved straight to trying to deal with some of these issues. Let me now quickly turn to the, to the questions uh, raised by, by the two Juliets, if I may. Uh, uh, Juliet Kiguli, if, if I re remember correctly, uh, mentioned uh, the, 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 the spread of the virus. Some of the latest research which has come out over the last, uh, last week or so seems to suggest that there are actually three strains of COVID-19, and uh, which, which raises some very, very difficult issues. And uh, uh, strain A seems to be that in the, in, in the US. Uh, it seems to be uh, less uh, lethal. Uh, many more people seem to be recovering from it. Um, and it appears that strain B, which is the strain which you find in Wuhan, uh, basically uh, uh, starts off in China. And then you have strain C, which uh, emerges out of, out of uh, Italy, okay? And seems to be very, very uh, lethal even more lethal than the, than the strain in China. Now, but if you look at the map, which is emerging about these different strains of COVID-19, the map is not one which, which I fully understand. I mean, how did it move from, how, what is the connection between say Singapore and, and Italy? I just don't understand that. So there are many questions. So a lot of these findings raise as many questions as they seem to answer. But the, the, the fact of the matter is that the, the strains suggest that there has been a mutation of the virus. And this is part of the reason why the, the whole problem of a cure and the whole problem of a vaccine becomes even more uh, uh, challenging. The other question which uh, Juliet also raises is the whole question of stigmatization. I think, uh, uh, to be quite honest, I see this as less of a problem with COVID-19 compared to, to, uh, to let us say, uh, with HIV AIDS or, um, or, or even with Ebola. Um, and it has to do with the specific characteristics of the, of, the, of, the, of the virus and the specific characteristics of the spread of the virus, the modes of transmission and infection. And this, of course, raises very uh, important questions, which at some point in the future, I'm sure many people will say, uh, have a lot to say, uh, to talk about in terms of the epidemiology uh, of, of this. But um, so far, you know, if you, if you think about, uh, if you think about malaria, you know, the, 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 col the colonial powers, uh, all they could do was to have their capitals in high places, in places like, uh, uh, like uh, 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 Nairobi and so on and so forth, not not uh, not in low places. The hope then was that uh, in high in high areas uh, 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 the mosquito would be less prolific, the Anopheles mosquito, and the likelihood of malaria and so on. So it raises very interesting. But you know, people were not uh, stigmatized because they had malaria. You know, uh, so I think. What we are seeing with COVID-19, uh, because it, it is an equal opportunity uh, infection, um, if I can use a, 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 a phrase like that, um, uh, that I, it's not very clear to me that the stigmatization is specific to the infection. I think the stigmatizations which already exist in society are what are likely to be, uh, to be accentuated as people struggle to deal uh, with the infection. Now, what does this mean in terms of physical distancing? Um, you can be quite sure uh, that people who are living in urban, in urban, in poor uh, urban agglomerations, who are more likely to be uh, physically very close, are likely to be stigmatized uh, in the sense that 
if, if I know, for example, that somebody is from an urban slum, I'm probably going to, uh, you know, be, be defensive, be, be, be cautious by trying to stay away from him or her. You know, this, this, is, this is likely to happen, but it's not, it's not very easy, you know, on the street to identify such people and to, and to, and to stigmatize them on, on, on such grounds. So, I, so the question of, the, of power, which, which, uh, which was raised in relation to, to that, is, is, is again very complex. And I, 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 I'll, I'll probably skip, have to skip this in the interest of time. The other Juliet from, from uh, Miser uh, raised a number of also very uh, interesting um, uh, um, questions about how do we democratize our strategies? Unfortunately, um, democra democratizing strategies are only available if there is early action. And so I am hoping that in Africa, insofar as if, we, if, it, if it is the case that, that infections have not spread very far in Africa, very extensively in Africa, there is the greater possibility of democratization, of consultation, and of ensuring uh, that, that, that precautionary measures are taken uh, 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 quite effectively. But if, if I'm wrong, and if the undercounting of infections in Africa is because of lack of testing, is because of, uh, uh, of uh, 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 not paying enough attention to the problems of the urban poor and so on and so forth, uh, then, then we are in serious trouble. Um, and uh, the, 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 the resorting to lockdowns uh, is very, very likely. Uh, now, having said that, it doesn't mean that, that uh, lockdowns uh, are predetermined. What is involved in a lockdown is predetermined. And we will need to think about how, um, uh, measure, how, how, what kinds of precautionary measures in the case of a lockdown. I mentioned earlier in the case of Kerala uh, that, that, for example, uh, uh, market women are using uh, old saris and other pieces of cloth uh, to cover their faces. And, and uh, uh, they are practicing physical distancing. So if you go to the market, you will see that, that people, uh, uh, that you, even the, where you stand in front of a market stall is sort of uh, the little circles are drawn for where you are supposed to stand. And you, you don't jump the line, you stand where you are, and only when the, when the customer before you has moved on, then you move forward and, and you make your purchase and, and so on and so forth. So there are very simple measures which ordinary people have come up with. You know? But the only way you come up with these measures is if you consult them. You, know? uh, you, know, you, you may be the, most, you may be the, the cleverest epidemiologist uh, in the world, but if you are not familiar with how people live, and this is where uh, Dr. Samsung's question about, about, uh, about uh, uh, anthropology becomes important and culture and, and so on and so forth. Then I think it will be extremely difficult uh, to, to implement measures uh, which, which are appropriate uh, in, these, uh, in these circumstances. So I think it becomes all the more um, diff uh, challenging, uh, not particularly, uh, we, we, we have the, our best chance at democratization uh, uh, in, if we are able to influence early actions, uh, we have less of a chance to influence uh, uh, lockdowns and, and the course of events because at that point, uh, the so-called experts will take over and they will tell us that there is no other way to do it except through lockdowns and so on and so forth. And in, the, in that kind of a, of a context, it becomes extremely difficult to try to influence uh, uh, pol pol policies, um, I, th I think I, I think at this stage uh, uh, probably it is best to leave the last uh, few minutes uh, to to Professor Mamdani to, to 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 sum up the discussion. But I want to thank all of you for this opportunity uh, because I, I do think uh, you are uh, in a sense in a very uh, special position of. Uh, being able to contribute uh, to uh, public policy um, if, uh, on an ongoing basis. 
uh, you know, about learning quickly and, and sharing information so that we can, we can, we can, we are able to, to intervene and try to shape things uh, as they are evolving, as they are evolving right now. Just rem remember that this whole thing started uh, barely, barely th three or four months ago. And, uh, and so much has happened. So much has already happened. And it has been a lifetime of learning for me personally. And I'm sure if you, once you get into some of the details, uh, you, 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 it will be, uh, you know, you, there's so much to learn and, and so much to think about. So once again, I want to thank you all for this opportunity and thank Professor Mamdani for kindly inviting me to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jomo. Um, I have a number of uh, questions which have been sent here on the chat room. Uh, some were sent by people who haven't identified themselves either by name or by institutional affiliation. Uh, others, Tutu uh, Zeleken uh, Nimwimbi has written out his question. Um, Adam Hihubi has uh, indicated the desire to ask a question. To all these, I must apologize because we don't have more time. It's midnight right now in Malaysia where Professor Sundaram is, and uh, uh, there's a limit to how much we can uh, call on his generosity. Patience, durability, all those very important characteristics. I want to say two things before I close. Um, one is that, uh, you know, I think we have to balance the pessimism with the optimism. Uh, if I think of the last, uh, uh, major crises uh, of, of this kind of proportions, uh, which I would liken to World War II. Um, just remember that uh, the kind of outcomes that we faced at the end of World War II. On the one hand, we faced uh, uh, Nazi Germany and, and the Holocaust. And on the other hand, we had the Chinese Revolution. We had the decolonizing movement uh, globally. Uh, we had uh, social democracy in the, in the West, we had uh, Keynesianism, um, and uh, like that crisis, this one too, I think brings with it mixed opportunities and as to what the outcome will be, will depend very much on, on us, what we now call agency, uh, but also on, we, on the kind of resources we are able to marshal uh, from our history, from our society, and through cooperation with one another. Um, finally, uh, this lecture uh, is being uh, uh, videoed and uh, it will be on the MISA website, uh, just as the last lecture with Professor Timothy Mitchell. Uh, the next lecture, which will be next Wednesday, is by Professor Partho Chatterjee. Uh, Partho Chatterjee will be talking on uh, democracy and populism. Uh, so we'll have another opportunity to visit our, the familiar figures of Trump, Modi, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, Finally, on behalf of Miser, my uh, heartfelt thanks to you, Jomo. Um, and I hope uh, uh, this return, which has not been physical, will be followed up by a visit uh, after COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Bye, all. Bye, everybody.